said something yesterday, which I wanted to remind you about today. We were talking about the universe being created ex nihilo out of nothing. And oh, it's hard man. for us to imagine nothing. When we imagine nothing, we always imagine empty space. But of course, the God uh, who created the universe, or who, whether you believe in God or not, a any scientist would say space itself and time were created 13.8 billion years ago. There was nothing, and out of nothing came the universe. We have no idea why. Uh, people say that uh, it can create its hawking, you said, can, says that the universe would create itself, which is ridiculous. But you made a point about the universe being created out of nothing, and I wanted to remind you about that. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you did, because I didn't complete my, where I started with Stephen Hawking was the shock at reading this statement. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So if it's okay, I'll go back to that oh, statement. Yeah, yeah. And it's ridiculous, but it's triply ridiculous, which is very difficult to write a sentence that's triply ridiculous. But he's very intelligent. Yes, I see. Well, anyway, because, let me analyze it if it's not too late in the day for logic. Um, because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe will create itself from nothing. That is a flat contradiction. Because there is something, law of gravity, yeah. the universe will create itself from nothing. Contradiction. That wipes it out completely. In other words, gravity itself uh, can't pre-exist the in other words, isn't he assuming that gravity pre-exists oh, the, the universe? He's saying something very interesting. He doesn't say because gravity exists. If he'd said because gravity exists, the universe will create itself from nothing, that would have been worse. Okay. Because gravity is something. Okay. He says because there is a law of gravity, but that's also something, but it's an abstract something. Yeah. But you see, what would gravity be if the, what would a law of gravity mean if there was no gravity? Right. And this opens a window to something else that's heavy. utterly fascinating. It's not difficult, actually. You just think, Lewis got there first. Lewis taught me this years ago, that the laws of nature don't create anything. And because there is a law of gravity, is moving in that direction, that the law somehow creates something. Well, Lewis dealt with this brilliantly. And I can illustrate it by a lovely conversation. I had a very brief one with Peter Atkins, who's a great atheist physical chemist, written hundreds of brilliant textbooks. He's a very good expositor. After a debate at Oxford, I wasn't debating, I was listening. I said, Peter, what created the universe? Without hesitation, he said mathematics. And I was so caught off guard, I started to laugh. And that was very embarrassing for me. <laughs> and he was not pleased. He said, why are you laughing? Well, I said, Peter, do you want an honest answer? He said, yes, I do. I said, because that's the stupidest thing I think I've ever heard. <laughs> he said, why? Not well, I said, honest, let please. me make it simple. One plus one equals two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? Now, this is Lewis. And he points out this huge mistake that people think that the laws of mathematics or physics create things. Listen, he says, the laws of motion, Newton's laws of motion, will never move a billiard ball in the history of the universe. A person with a cue do that. The law of motion describes its bounces for a while anyway, but it won't move it. And then he says, you know, you can do arithmetic from here to all eternity, and it'll never produce any money. You first get one dollar and then another dollar and you'll have two. But first get your dollars. Because the laws are all of the form. If you have A and B, you'll get C. But you've got to get A and B first. And sometimes I try to make it slightly amusing. Well, it's a bit sad for people who've lived through the financial crisis. Because our great financial crisis was caused in part by people who thought mathematics could create money. Uh -huh. It doesn't. The mathematics just does the describing. So here's Hawking saying, a law of gravity is enough. It isn't. 
Paul Davis says the same thing more explicitly. He says, I don't like to think of a God tinkering. They always use negative put-down yeah, words. Tinkering. I like to think of a clever law of mathematics doing the whole thing. Now he's talking nonsense. Well, the idea, first of all, we have to talk about what is a law of mathematics or what is mathematics. Um, is that not abstract? In other words, of course if, it's if, abstract. If we do not perceive these things in our minds and, it's and, immaterial. and write, them, immaterial. write them on a piece of paper, what is it? Yes, exactly. It's, it's completely, you know, you almost have to ask, if, if there weren't a human being to perceive the math, does the math exist? Yes, that is if a there very interesting question. If there weren't a mind, God's mind or our mind, to perceive the math, can the math exist without our perception of it? Yes. My reaction to a lot of this is, as I said earlier, Hawking's a brilliant mathematician, utterly. But there are aspects of the nature of maths and science they simply do not understand. Now that goes on in that sense. We've now seen it's this flat contradiction, so it's false. Secondly, the idea of a law of gravity on its own doing something is false. That's the second false well, it's also, idea. It's also funny. Yes, it is. Now here's the funniest idea, though, is the third part of the sentence. The universe will create itself. Well, if I say that X creates Y, roughly speaking, I'm saying something like if you've got X, you'll get Y. You're presupposing say, X. Yes. If I say X creates X, I'm saying if you've got X, you've got X. You'll yeah. get X. And what does that mean? Well, this is the way I put it. It means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if Stephen Hawking writes it. <laughs> Now, wow. Here is the key argument of his book. This is a simple it's, it's, argument. It's actually embarrassing and sad. Yes. Because and there's been no response from that camp to my book whatsoever in about five years. No. Well, again, this is why I do these little things, uh, b because we need to talk about these things more and force people to recognize that uh, their gods, small g, like Stephen Hawking, uh, have feet of clay. It's amazing that you can, in a few minutes, make the central thesis of his most recent book sound not only false, but ridiculous. And I'm not finished yet. And you're not finished yet. No, because we must talk about nothing, you and I. Yeah, actually. Now, I'm going to be very serious about nothing. I wanted to bring you back to your yes, statement. Yes, much ado about nothing, yeah, but okay. there is much ado about yeah. nothing. You see, here's Hawking, the universe created itself from nothing. Now, what is nothing? You ask that question. Well, when you look at his book, you think nothing is the absence of anything. That's how we normally, that's the normal meaning of the word. Okay. What we call the philosophical meaning of it. Okay. Of anything. But oh no. As you go through the book, you discover nothing is a quantum vacuum. He says that. Yes, yes, he does, and various other things. Can you tell us what, that, such, what a quantum well, vacuum is? Not really. Okay. Not really, but it's certainly not nothing. In fact, if you want fun, you ought to get this. I don't have it here to quote, but quote it on one of your programs on Science and God. David Albert's review of Lawrence Krauss's book, a universe from nothing is hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> now, Lawrence Krauss is another, he now goes round with Dawkins. I think he tries to replace Christopher Hitchens, you know, as a great new atheist. He's written a book, A Universe from Nothing. So I picked this up and I thought this would be interesting. I've crossed swords with him a couple of times. <laughs> but anyway, in the first few pages of the book, I come across this sentence which I've memorized because it's so wonderful. Here's what he says. Because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. That is very interesting. What? That is very interesting. It's utter nonsense. Well, of course it is, but, the, but, but it's, it is saying that uh, it, it's insisting that, um, it, well, it's, <laughs> it's almost making nothingness sound purely subjective. In other words, it's only our perception of nothingness through a materialistic lens. H how, do you, how do you talk about nothingness? Yes, like, because he's desperate. And the reason he's desperate, let's stand back for this. There's a big canvas here. 
the irony of all of this is that the current views, although some of them are changing at the moment, but let's take the average state at the moment, is that the universe started, as you said, space-time started 13.45 billion years ago. And there was nothing. Nothing. Now, that means, here's the big question that Leibniz asked. Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, so long as you believe in an eternal universe, you don't have a problem. Yeah. The problem is now created. How do you get a universe from nothing? Hence all these books addressing this question, nothing. Everyone I have read talks nonsense. Now, this is very interesting. To get rid of the obvious answer, which I'll come to in a moment, they redefine nothing. That's the way it's done. You redefine nothing. And <laughs> this idea that because something is physical, nothing must be. That is just sheer nonsense. It has no meaning whatsoever. And he goes on through the book and all sorts of definitions of nothing. And, and David Albert has this marvelous review. And he points out that the very last thing there nothing is, is nothing. But I got invited to the Harvard MIT Faculty Club, of which you may have heard. And I was invited to have an open dialogue with Alan Guth. Now, Alan Guth is the world's leading cosmologist at MIT. Very nice man. And he's the inventor of the theory of inflation. That is the idea that a very, very short time after the Big Bang, there was a massive acceleration in the expansion of the universe and so on. And it explains certain things and people still query it, of course. It's, there's a lot of speculation, but nevertheless, he is immensely famous and deservedly so. And I was having this debate and I was terrified, of course. He's the world's number one cosmologist and we're talking about things that involve God, which he didn't do, actually. His talk went like this. Let me tell you about the origin of the universe and inflation and so on. And we had 15 minutes each. And in the last 30 seconds, he said, of course, if you want to add God to that, that's fine, but I prefer not to. That was the total about God. Mm. I talked about God and um, received a lot of hostility, which is rather strange and such an erudite thing. But in the question session, I thought I'd ask him publicly. I said, Alan, you know, there's a question that I've been dying to ask someone of your eminence. Everybody is talking about nothing. And I said, tell us, when you use the word nothing in the context of the origin of the universe, do you mean what most of us mean by nothing? That is the absence of anything. He said, no, we do not. I said, thank you very much. So I know all about nothing, you see, as a result of that. It is massively fascinating that the only way to avoid God is foolishness. Now, hang that on, hang on. That is just fascinating. That's an aphorism worthy of putting on a sampler. That's just beautiful. Well, you the may only way to, to avoid me. God we is, can start a business. is foolishness. Um, no. The only way to avoid God in that context in that is, foolishness. Is, is foolishness when you're dealing with the concept of nothing. But there's something I need to say here because Christian people often say, well, what do you say? What is your answer as a Christian? And I've come to see this is important. And the way I put it very carefully is this. The universe comes from nothing physical. It does not come from nothing. It comes from God who is not physical. And one of the great assertions of scripture is that God is spirit. And this turns materialism on its head. Materialism says there is material, there is no spirit. Yeah. The biblical view is there's both, but the primary one is spirit. In the beginning was the word, the word is material, the word is God, the word is spirit. All things came to be through him. That is, the material universe is not primary. Materialism says it is. Naturalism says it is. Scripture says it is not. God is primary. It's derivative. So the universe came from nothing physical.